NASA has always been at the forefront of exploration, pushing the boundaries of what's possible. But not every mission has gone according to plan. These are the dark NASA missions that went horribly wrong. So this Boeing Starliner situation has turned out to be quite the saga. For those that don't know, the mission was originally supposed to last just eight days. Astronauts Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams launched in early June, but they've now been stuck in orbit for almost three months because of some problems with the Starliner capsule. So what happened? Well, there are a couple of big issues at play here. The main problem has to do with the reaction control thrusters, which are super important for maneuvering the spacecraft. During the approach to the International Space Station, five out of the 28 thrusters failed. That's a huge concern because if those thrusters don't work, it makes docking and undocking a real challenge. Imagine trying to park a car in like a tight space, but sometimes it just doesn't respond to your steering. Now imagine doing that in space, surrounded by multi-billion dollar spacecraft and the ISS, which has been operational for over 25 years. Now despite the thruster failures, the crew did manage to dock with the ISS, but the problems didn't stop there. There's also a helium leak. Some leaks were known before the launch, but then additional ones popped up during the flight. Monitoring helium levels is critical because they affect the capsule's ability to operate properly. If the helium levels drop too low, it could jeopardize the astronaut's safe return home. And they can't just fix the helium leak without engineers on board to troubleshoot, which means the astronauts are stuck waiting while engineers are working figuring out the problems on Earth. But a little update on this Starliner case. NASA is gearing up to bring back Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams from the ISS. The SpaceX Dragon spacecraft is going to bring them home, which at the time of recording this is just preparing to launch today. The SpaceX flight was originally going to be a four-person mission, but now they'll be launching with just two to make room for Wilmore and Williams. American astronaut Nick Haig and Russian astronaut Alexander Gorbanov will be flying the Dragon capsule to the ISS. Haig stated, we're going to launch as a two-person crew, and then we're going to land as a four-person crew. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't mean an immediate rescue, though. Even with the Dragon spacecraft on the way, it's expected that Wilmore and Williams won't be back on Earth until February. The transition isn't simple. The, st the stranded astronauts are going to have to learn how the Dragon works. Spacecrafts aren't like cars. You can't just hop in and operate it the same way you would with your other vehicle. Haig mentioned that the ground teams have been working with Wilmore and Williams to help them understand what they'll need to be doing inside the Dragon, but in the meantime, Wilmore and Williams are staying busy aboard the ISS, just helping with routine maintenance and continuing experiments. Williams mentioned how cool it'll be to fly in two different spacecraft. We're testers, that's what we do, she said. So yeah, it really seems like they're making the best of their situation. Skylab was NASA's first space station which launched in 1973 and was in operation until 1979. It was a groundbreaking project that gave us a ton of valuable information about life in space and how we could live and work there. But when most people think about Skylab, they remember the crash, which makes sense. It was kind of a big deal. NASA didn't really plan ahead for how Skylab would come back down. They knew it would eventually re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, but they underestimated the chaos that could ensue. They expected Skylab to last around nine years, but the technology to control its descent just wasn't available back then. So there wasn't a solid plan for when it would come back to Earth. And a best case scenario, they thought they'd have a one in 152 chance of someone getting hurt. They tried to guide Skylab to the Indian Ocean with some rockets. And for the most part, they succeeded. The bigger pieces landed in the ocean, which was great news, but some debris fell right over Australia. Thankfully, no one got hurt and nothing major was damaged. In fact, one guy even scored 10,000 bucks for delivering a piece of Skylab debris to a newspaper. Authorities weren't thrilled though, and NASA got fined a whopping $400 for littering, which is like 10 cents for them. Anyway, things could have been a lot worse, but this was a bit of a wake up call for them. Michael J. Adams was a skilled pilot and engineer known for his role as one of the 12 astronauts flying the North American X-15, an experimental space plane. Now on November 15th of 1967, Adams took part in his seventh X-15 flight. He achieved an impressive altitude of 266,000 feet, 
qualifying him as an astronaut. But as he began his descent, the X-15 began to experience severe aerodynamic pressure, leading to a violent high-speed spin. By the time he descended to 65,000 feet, the aircraft was in a nosedive. The X-15 broke apart, and Adams became the first American astronaut to die during a space mission. On July 21st, 1961, the Mercury Redstone 4 mission piloted by astronaut Virgil Gus Grissom successfully launched. The spacecraft, nicknamed Liberty Bell 7, made a suborbital flight that lasted about 15 minutes. Everything seemed to be going well until the splashdown in the Atlantic Ocean. After a relatively smooth descent and successful parachute deployment, Grissom prepared for recovery, but then he heard a sudden thud. The hatch cover, designed to blow off in emergencies, unexpectedly exploded off the capsule, and now water was flooding in. Liberty Bell 7 began to sink. Grissom quickly unbuckled his harness, removed his helmet, and climbed through the hatch. Meanwhile, the recovery helicopters were still a couple miles away. Fortunately, though, a nearby helicopter crew saw Grissom exit the sinking capsule, and he was hoisted up by the helicopter. But Liberty Bell 7 wasn't so lucky. It sank into the ocean, and it wasn't until 1999 that the spacecraft was recovered. The Mars Climate Orbiter launched on December 11th, 1998. It was a robotic space probe that was supposed to help us learn about Mars's climate, atmosphere, and surface changes. It was also supposed to serve as a communication relay for another mission called the Mars Polar Lander. But on September 23rd, 1999, contact with the spacecraft was lost. As the orbiter approached Mars, it was on a trajectory that brought it too close to the planet. It ended up either being destroyed in the atmosphere or flying away into orbit around the sun. Sure, it wasn't a crewed mission, but just think of the time, money, and effort it takes for these things. Imagine spending years and over $270 million on a project and then just watching it vanish away. So what went wrong? Well, first of all, there was a mix-up between measurement systems. NASA uses the metric system, but Lockheed Martin, the company that built the spacecraft, was using US customary units. So that's a pretty big oversight. A piece of software that calculated the thruster's total impulse was giving results in pound force seconds instead of the expected Newton seconds. So this mismatch messed with the navigation calculations, leading the orbiter to enter the Martian atmosphere at a much lower altitude than they had originally planned, about 110 kilometers instead of the intended 226. The team knew something was off. Just a day before the orbital insertion, the calculations showed the orbiter would be way too close to the surface, like dangerously close. Instead of skimming through the upper atmosphere as planned, it likely entered at such a low altitude that it either burned up or bounced off a thicker atmosphere. Some navigators had even raised concerns earlier about the trajectory, but the warnings were just brushed aside because they hadn't followed the proper documentation procedures. But in the end, NASA as a whole took responsibility for the failure. The Mars Polar Lander, or MPL for short, was another one of NASA's big hopes for exploring Mars, specifically its polar regions. It was launched in January of 1999. The MPL was designed to gather information about water on Mars and whether the planet might have once supported life. After a long journey, it finally reached Mars in December, and everyone was very excited. The lander began its descent, and then silence. Communication with MPL just stopped. NASA spent a whole month trying to contact it, but nothing worked. Eventually, they had to face the reality. The mission was a total failure. So what happened? Well, the leading theory is that during the descent, the MPL's onboard computers got some mixed signals. It seemed like it was touching down, even though it was still quite a distance from the surface. Believing it had landed safely, the computers shut off the engines. This led to a hard crash instead of a gentle touchdown. But again, that's just a theory. To this day, we still don't know exactly what went wrong. Moving on now to the Orbital Carbon Observatory, or the OCO. This was going to be used to measure Earth's CO2 levels. Launched on February 24th, 2009, it had nine years of hard work and a $270 million investment behind it. Everyone was excited about what the OCO could do, but it never made it out of our atmosphere. Instead, it plummeted back down and crashed into the Indian Ocean near Antarctica. And it was all thanks to a minor problem that snowballed 
into a massive one. When rockets launch, they have this protective cover called a payload fairing that shields the satellite during ascent. But in OCO's case, the fairing didn't detach as it was supposed to. This extra weight meant that the rocket didn't have enough power to break free from Earth's atmosphere. Almost a decade spent building something and then it just falls back to Earth because of a single glitch. On February 1st, 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated on re-entry over Texas and Louisiana. All seven astronauts on board were killed, making it the second catastrophic failure in the Space Shuttle program following the Challenger disaster in 1986. The shuttle launched from Kennedy Space Center on January 16th of 2003 after multiple delays. The crew, which had been selected back in July of 2000, included Commander Rick Husband, Pilot William McCool, Payload Commander Michael Anderson, Flight Engineer Kalpana Chawla, and Mission Specialists David Brown, Laurel Clark, and Ilan Ramon, who was the first Israeli astronaut. About 81 seconds into the flight, a piece of foam insulation broke off from the external tank. The foam hit Columbia's left wing at a high speed. During the mission, a team was set up to assess the damage, but they downplayed the risk, believing that there had been foam strikes before, which hadn't caused any serious issues. And when it came time to re-enter the atmosphere on February 1st, the crew began their preparations. Little did they know that the damage to the left wing had allowed hot gases to penetrate the shuttle's structure. And during re-entry, Columbia began to experience a series of failures. Just moments before losing communication, the crew sensed something was wrong, but they didn't have time to react. At 9 a.m., Columbia broke apart, scattering debris across several states. On January 27th, 1967, a fire broke out during a pre-launch test for the Apollo 1 mission. The astronauts, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger B. Chaffee, were conducting what's called a plugs out test. They were strapped into their seats in the command module ready to conduct a simulated launch. The test was gonna be low risk because the spacecraft wasn't fueled and all the explosive systems were disabled. But during the test, Grissom smelt a strange odor in the cabin, describing it as similar to sour buttermilk. Though air samples were taken, no cause for the smell was identified. Then at 6.31 p.m., a fire erupted in the cabin. Grissom was the first to alert ground control, exclaiming fire, just moments before total chaos ensued. The cabin was filled with pure oxygen, making the fire spread rapidly. Grissom's microphone picked up sounds of scuffling and panic as the crew tried to escape, but in seconds, they were engulfed in flames. It took nearly five minutes to reach the crew, and when they finally entered the module, they found the astronauts' bodies partially fused to the interior. It's one of the most horrific incidents in NASA's history. With all that said, though, I've been your host, James, and I'll catch you, yes, you specifically, in the next video.